Um, I want to begin um, by saying assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuhu. Um, uh, peace, blessings, and the mercy of God be with you all. That's a universal Muslim greeting. I'm, I'm not a Muslim. I'm, I'm a Roman Catholic, but uh, those words uh, I find flow easily uh, from my lips because I've been taught the meaning of them, uh, the profound meaning of, of them by uh, so many uh, of my Muslim uh, friends throughout the years, um, and that has helped me uh, understand uh, the meaning of those words uh, in my own tradition and how they resonate with, with the deepest values um, uh, uh, that are shared uh, by so many of the, the great uh, religious traditions of the world. So I bring you these greetings um, from Catholic Theological Union in Chicago, where um, I've been teaching for the last uh, 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 10 years now. Um, but most recently, I, I, I come from, um, I've come from Taipei, and the only reason I'm sharing that with you is because I'm a little jet-lagged, and I don't offer that as an excuse because um, oftentimes, you know, th there are frequently, you know, enormous flaws in my thinking and my presentations. I usually can't blame them on jet lag, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but today maybe I can lean a little bit on that excuse. Um, but I just wanted to sort of warn you uh, that if, if there's any extra incoherence, incoherence beyond what there usually is in my presentations, it might be because of that. I also wanted to just share a little bit of anxiety. There are some people in this audience, some people connected with Pacifica, uh, Professor Amir Hussein of uh, Loyola Marymount University, um, yeah, who make uh, this, this dynamic of me making a presentation on Islam and Muslims in the current global context, moving beyond media sound bites, uh, somewhat intimidating. Um, it reminds me of the story of uh, this this man who survived the great Johnstown flood of the early part of the 20th century in Pennsylvania, not 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 too far from Pittsburgh, and over 2,000 people died in this flood. I think a dam broke, and it was really uh, quite a disaster. It was nationally known, um, and and this one man, we'll call him uh, Mr. Bill Smith. Um, you know, survived, and from that point on, whenever he would be with people, he would regale them with the stories of his survival of the Johnstown flood. You know, and uh, he was such a wonderful man that that people indulged him. You know, all the time, and uh, was very beloved by all. And the story goes, he's on his deathbed, and 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 he's about to, you know, meet God, and his family is all gathered around, and his pastor comes in, and he. You know, and his pastor says, you know, I'm here, Bill. And, and Bill says, Pastor, do you have any advice for me? You know, if I'm blessed by God and I enter through the pearly gates, you know, this is a Christian metaphor for entering into paradise, you know, and I meet God, you know, I meet the people in heaven, do you have any advice for me? He said, well, Bill, I do have one, I have no doubt that you're going to go through the pearly gates. He said, um, and I have no doubt that when you do and you meet the throngs of saints who are in heaven, you are going to want to share your story about surviving the, Jones, the Johnstown flood. And Bill's kind of nodding with what little strength he has left in his frail body at that time. And he says, I, my one piece of advice is to remember one thing, Bill. Noah, alayhi salam, will be in the audience. <laughs> Okay, so, <laughs> so there are Noahs in my audience today, and uh, uh, so that, that makes us uh, somewhat uh, intimidating. But um, let me just say that, that, that what, what, I'm try what I'm attempting to do um, is just to spend about 45 minutes uh, reflecting on issues that I've come to experience as uh, playing a large role in the minds of a lot of folks in sort of contemporary US American culture, um, largely non-Muslim folks. I mean, this is a presentation that's largely designed for a, for a non-Muslim audience. Um, uh, things that are in their mind because of what they're reading in newspapers, uh, hearing on television, really what's coming through the mass media about Islam, Muslims in the current global context. And um, as many of you know, uh, you know the, the, the great limitation of the mass media is that it, 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 it deals in sound bites. And oftentimes the issues that require our, our greatest and deepest attention are far too complex uh, to really uh, treat adequately and decently, even in terms of trying to convey information in the soundbite. 
even by the most well-intentioned uh, folks in the media. Um, I don't think, as some people think, that the only remedy for this is reading five books for every topic that you're interested in. I actually think that you can make a little bit of progress just maybe spending 45 minutes, um, you know, taking maybe five or six minutes, you know, on, on some of these issues and breaking them open uh, a little more than, than, than they're able to be broken open um, in a mass media context, okay? So that's basically what I'm, I'm trying to do uh, the, 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 this, this evening with you. So, um, and I will try to, I, I think I've got about eight points. Um, I don't think I, what, what, I, what I want to do is make sure I honor the time. Um, so I want to try to finish by about um, uh, 7, uh, 7.15, so then we have some time for questions um, and, and, and discussion. Um, so I might not get through all the points, that's fine. I'll try not to linger too long on, on any one slide. Some of these slides are favorites of mine and I can tend to linger a bit too long on them than others, but I'll try to curtail that um, bad habit of mine. So let's, let's go to the first one. Um, you know, this is, a, this is a point that sort of uh, I often like to share with, with folks that comes from my background uh, as a historian of religions. Um, it's kind of one of the, one of the axioms of the, the critical study of religion is not to be deceived by the singular, the grammatical singular of the names we give to the great religious traditions of the world. Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism. Why do I say this? Because the, the singularity of those terms, right, masks enormous diversity stunning and amazing diversity. Uh, both contemporaneously, if you talk about you know, Hindus in the world today, you're talking about so many different styles of, of piety and, and, and practice and way of life that exist in so many different South Asian cultures, so many different subcultures within the larger South Asian cultural milieu. Um, even in a religion like Judaism, in which, you're, which you only have about 15, one five million people worldwide. Uh, you've got at least five major expressions of, 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 of Jewishness. I mean, you've got the major denominations of sort of orthodox, uh, conservative, uh, reform, reconstructionist. A and then you have, you know, um, Jews for whom their Jewish identity and certain aspects of the Jewish tradition as a religion are very important, but they don't really practice Judaism qua religion, you know, as a religion. Um, sometimes they'll refer to themselves as secular Jews. And so five different major expressions and variegations within those expressions just among 15 million people. Um, when we're talking about Islam, we're talking about you know, what, 1.4 billion people around the world existing in hundreds of different cultures. Um, this is even more the case. So the point I'm trying to make here about Islam is a point that one can and should make about all religious traditions. It is not a monolith. It's a faith lived out in a variety of different cultural and historical expressions, some of which mo certain Muslims deem to be more authentic than others. And that last part of the phrase is referring to a phenomenon in the history of religions known simply as sectarianism. I'm going to use the word in a value-neutral sense. It's just that you know people within uh, these these traditions um, and you know see certain kinds of diversity as acceptable, and then other forms of diversity as unacceptable. You know, you've crossed this line. Well, no, no, you've crossed that line. You know, that kind of thing, and that goes on. You know, in every religious tradition. So, so you have diversity and then you have sort of people within the traditions making judgments about what is acceptable diversity and, 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 and what is not, okay? So this is, this is no different for Islam than it is for any other religious tradition. And too often times, the singularity of the term Islam is at the root of, 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 of some of the, uh, the grossest stereotypes uh, about, about Islam and Muslims. And so we have to keep that in mind. Um, the second point is, is, is a point that's sort of meant to reinforce this first point, uh, but instead of working with the abstraction, Islam, this, this generalization that's kind of a, uh, you know, at least from a, from a critical academic perspective, a, a kind of abstract construct, um, people, Muslims. So I want to just sh share a few faces with you. Anyone know who this lady is? 
Yeah, and she might look familiar to some of you. This is Shirin Ibadi. Shirin Ibadi um, won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2004, I think. I might be getting my dates mixed up. Um, I'd like to say because of the jet lag, but it's no, I sometimes just get dates mixed up. <laughs> um, so, winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, Iranian woman, um, uh, Shiite Muslim background, um, lawyer, uh, advocate to particularly for uh, women and children's rights in her native Iran. Okay, Shirin Ibadi, Nobel Peace Prize winner. Anyone recognize this face? Okay, by show of hands, how many do not recognize this face? You get my point? Why? And this is, I tell you, this is a ubiquitous, I have given this, I say the president, I've used this slide with like 100% Muslim audiences. It's no different, the reaction is no different. All the Muslims recognize the global Muslim terrorist, and hardly any of them recognize the Muslim who won the Nobel Peace Prize. Why? Because we're all, we're all reading the same media. We're all subject to the same media, you know, at least here in the United States. So we share these, you know, we share these kinds of uh, perceptions. But you see, this is a serious perception problem that, that, that someone who in her own work, whether she would identify it this way or not, is representing some of the deepest values of the Islamic tradition, right? And someone in his life, who according to the judgment of the vast majority of Muslims, is not representing the deepest values of, of Islam, although he might claim to be doing so. Um, you, know, um, you know, everyone recognizes one, he is very well known, and the other, uh, not well known at all. Um, you know, we could do the quiz more, but in the interest of time, I'll give this away. This is Muhammad Yunus. Another Muslim Nobel Peace Prize winner from Bangladesh. He's the pioneer of uh, micro lending with the Grameen Bank, right? You give small loans to people in villages, and uh, you know, just $200 can make a huge difference. A person can start a business and help lift, the, uh, lift themselves and their entire village uh, out of abject poverty. And so, um, you know, a very, very important sort of contribution. Um, this is uh, Nidal uh, Malik Hassan. Um, he's the gentleman that was responsible uh, for the shooting spree at Fort Hood in Killeen, Texas a few years ago. Actually, my birthplace. Uh, I was born at Fort Hood in Killeen, Texas. Um, you know, maybe some of you, you know, don't recognize, you know, his face as much as maybe the face of uh, Osama bin Laden. You know, what's interesting here, though, is that, you know, and this doesn't get talked about enough, you know, if you read the story of, uh, of this man, um, his story has a lot more to do with, with Columbine than it does with September 11th. You know, it's, it's more uh, a very sad drama of a man who really felt ostracized, a male, you know, who felt ostracized and marginalized um, in a world in which sort of, sort of uh, camaraderie is, is very, very important to identity. And the reason for his ostracization was his ethnicity and his religion. You know, he had scratched on his car a lot. This was in a New York Times article, but these articles, you never find them on the front page, you know. Um, uh, I can't remember what it was. But, but slurs against Islam and, and things like this. You know, people scratch these things into his car, uh, you know, on the army base. None of this justifies, of course, what he did. But I think, you know, we, it, it has more to do with what ostracized males um, in U.S. American culture with access to guns will sometimes do uh, than it does even with the ideology of someone like um, uh, the late Osama bin Laden. A lot of people in this room know who this couple is. This is uh, Tayyip Erdogan and Mrs. Erdogan, the Prime Minister of Turkey. Um, I like to say you, you very rarely find a photo of the two of them together like this, uh, particularly in a public appearance. And then I like to ask people, does anyone know why that is? Does anyone here know why that is? It's because of Mrs. Erdogan's fashion choices. <laughs> it's not really a fashion choice, obviously, right? Mrs. Erdogan wears hijab, right? Um, and it's not legal uh, under Turkish law for her to wear hijab at state functions. Her husband is the prime minister of Turkey. <laughs> so it's almost, almost wherever he is, it's de facto a state function. So it's very hard for her to appear with him in public with her hijab on, you know, in a country that's, you know, 95 plus percent Muslim. 
um, you know, um, she's, she's not allowed to wear this uh, traditional uh, expression of traditional uh, Muslim modesty for women um, in, 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 in public, you know, with her, with her husband this way. Um, you know, and Turkey is contiguous with uh, Iran, which is another uh, Muslim majority country uh, where a, a woman couldn't attend a public event without, you know, having her head covered. Uh, you know, so the media want the, the media sound bites uh, lead us to accept a stereotype uh, that really does uh, gross injustice to the complexity of the reality that's really there. Um, this is uh, uh, Ingrid Matson. She's a professor of Islamic studies and Christian Muslim relations at Hartford Seminary, PhD from University of Chicago, and outgoing president, two-term president of the Islamic Society of North America, um, a Canadian uh, Muslim. Uh, a convert to Islam who, um, you know, wears hijab and um, you have to trust me, you can ask uh, Amir Hussein and some other people here who know Ingrid um, to use this expression, there are no flies on Ingrid, you know, um, <laughs> Ingrid wears the hijab as an expression of her power as a Muslim woman, um, not, uh, not as an expression of, 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 of oppression or a sign of, of oppression. I'm not suggesting that, that, that it, it can't be, uh, it doesn't function as an instrument of oppression in certain contexts, it does, but the whole issue here is we have to pay attention to those contexts and the differences in the context and the stereotypes types are what really um, lead us down a number of blind alleys that are very unproductive. This is Muhammad al-Baradai. Uh, he's another Muslim Nobel Prize winner. This is 2008, the Peace Prize winner uh, for his work as the head of the International Atomic Energy Association. Uh, it was Mr. Baradai who was in Iraq before the U.S. invasion basically pleading with his bosses at the U.N. saying, let me finish because I don't find any WMDs. I'm not finding any. And of course, there were none. <laughs> you know, um, so he didn't get to finish his work, unfortunately. And um, a lot of uh, a lot of bad things happened uh, because of that. Um, he's now gained a little more prominence. He was, you know, kind of really involved in the in the Tahrir Square, so-called Tahrir Square uprising in Egypt, as a as a kind of a voice of a of a new democratic Egypt that many young Egyptians kind of looked to and admired. It's still unclear. Uh, what role he may play in the future of Egyptian politics because what we have to watch closely in that story is um, whether the military um, will loosen its grip on, on, on control in Egyptian society. The problem is not Hosni Mubarak, the problem is the establishment of which Hosni Mubarak was, was a part. That's another issue that the, the sound bites of the media don't often, uh, don't often break open. This is Rukhaya Ghassara. She won the Asian Games in Doha in 2002, I think, for the 400 meter dash. And she, um, uh, she proudly wears her hijab um, with the Nike swoosh. Can you see it? It's a, it um, oops, I, I, I'm, I wanted the laser. There's the Nike swoosh. Uh, if there ever were a symbol of postmodernism, there it is. The, the tradition meets modernity and in a tempest mixed this kind of thing. And you notice she covers down to her wrists and also she wears long uh, athletic uh, pants and, and, and she says that she does this because her running, her, her athletic prowess is a gift from God and the, the way she feels like she can actualize it most effectively as an athlete um, is by honoring God, you know, uh, in the way she, she competes. And part of that for her is, 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 is dressing modestly like she does there. Um, this young Palestinian boy holding a sign in English saying terror is our common enemy. Usually you see uh, Palestinians throwing things, um, uh, you know, Israelis in tanks. Uh, there are lots of Palestinians and Israeli, Israelis that are assiduous, assiduously um, working for peace, um, maybe even the vast majority. Um, uh, Imam uh, Faisal Abdurraouf and his wife Daisy Khan, you know, these are the people behind the mosque at Ground Zero. Remember this from last summer, uh, which was neither uh, neither a mosque. It was a d designed to be a, a planned community center, like the 92nd Street Y, uh, sponsored by the Muslim community, with a, cer certainly a prayer area, like there were prayer areas for little masjids in the in the World Trade Center when they were when they were destroyed on September 11th. Um, you know, really trying to do so much good and the proximity to, uh, you know, to the site of the tragedy of September 11th was, was intentional, 
um, uh, not not that uh, as the Islamophobes would suggest, you know, uh, because uh, these people want to sort of st stake some triumphalist uh, claim, <laughs> you know, over this over this site in the name of Islam, but precisely because they're aware of all these voices that are saying, you know, where are the moderate Muslims? I don't hear the moderate Muslims. Well. Because all kinds of problems with the appellation moderate Muslim, then it's kind of like I like to say it's kind of like saying non pedophile Catholic priest. I mean, you know, no, I don't know any priest uh, that would like to be referred to as a non pedophile Catholic priest, even though technically I guess that's a good thing to be. Um, why? Because you, you you want people to recognize that the norm for Catholic priests is is not to be a pedophile. So the norm for Muslims is to be what others would regard as moderate. So we, you know, moderate Muslim is not. Not really a compliment, you know, for most uh, for most Muslims, um, but they but they heard this, you know, and they wanted so much to take action, to show the world what they believe to be the true face of Islam, and they do it, and you saw what happened. <laughs> uh, of course, midterm elections were coming up, and that had a lot to do with some politicians wanting to make make hay with this and and uh, stir up a lot of fear and a lot of hatred. So look at these faces. Right? This is an Islam that's variegated, complex, and I hope in some ways, in terms of the human beings who embody the tradition in one way or another, uh, this, this kind of montage um, you know, kind of uh, gets the point across uh, of the first uh, the slide, that Islam is certainly not uh, uh, monolithic. Like all human beings, Muslims are diverse and complex social actors, and they interpret and live out uh, their faith, you know, within uh, the stuff of their uh, of their context, and and that's what makes for uh, the variation in Islam, like it makes for variation in any religious tradition. All right, so we got that kind of internal diversity issue kind of out on the table. That's so that's usually obscured in so much of the mass media uh, sound bites. Um, now to the other issue that lots of people you know, walk in the room of any talk on Islam with the Islam and violence, right? This is a, it's an old sort of stereotype about Islam that's been around for a long time uh, in the West for interesting historical reasons that we don't have time to get into. But you oftentimes ha hear people asking, why is there so much conflict in the Muslim world? You know, why, for example, are Sunnis and Shiites killing each other in Iraq? Are Muslims inherently violent or are we missing something? You probably guessed by now that I'm going to go with the we're missing something answer to this. Uh, given that the Muslims inherently violent answer, uh, I hope we can all recognize that as negative essentialism and therefore the, 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 you know, the sort of foundational element of racism and bigotry. <laughs> um, but um, uh, if we're missing something, what are we missing? Well, for one thing, I want to start by just um, showing you uh, f uh, two sets of images. Uh, to try to uh, articulate the, the point I want to make here. This first is not um, Sh Sh Sunnis and Shiites killing each other in Iraq. It's actually Protestants and Catholics in conflict in Northern Ireland. Um, and as recent as 2009, so even after the, the Good Friday um, Accords. Um, you know, I, I, I've showed this, I've actually, uh, not, not showed this, but at times when I've e used this example, you know, some, uh, some, you know, erudite, you know, academics will raise their hand and say, this is a false analogy, Scott. Everyone knows that the conflict in Northern Ireland has nothing to do with religion, that it has everything to do with politics and power dynamics and this kind of thing. And you know what, by saying that, they've actually done my job for me, because that's exactly the point that, that I, that I want to make. That's precisely the point I want to make. See, they want to say that, you know, no, the Sunnis and Shiites in Iraq, they're killing each other, you know, over religion. But, they, but the Catholics and Protestants in Ireland, they're not killing themselves over religion. Well, not exactly. Um, uh, look at this picture. Um, this is uh, Cardinal Sean Brady, who's the, uh, the, um, the Catholic primate of Ireland, right? Um, and this is uh, Right Reverend Alan Harper, who's the Anglican Bishop of Ireland, okay, uh, primarily Northern Ireland. Um, this is not a, a, a break 
um, in their fight with each other. You know, they haven't just been hitting each other with the croziers trying to tear each other's robes off. And the journalist says, could you gentlemen pause just for a moment? I want to take a picture of you. Uh, the reason why they're standing congenially next to each other is because they have been working together to try to resolve the troubles, as they're called, in Northern Ireland for many, many years, ever since they've had their, their positions trying to use the power of their office as religious leaders uh, to try to get people, Protestants and Catholics, to actually focus on what the values of their Christian confessions actually are and how those values are actually calling them not to relate in the way they are relating, but to try to address the, the serious justice issues and power issues that the people of Northern Ireland are suffering from um, in a way that has integrity um, and that in a way in itself is just. Um, what we're missing behind this in terms of the power conflict is some history here. Okay, and uh, you know, it, it, it's the history of uh, one people being conquered and dominated by another people. The English, right, uh, colonizing and dominating Ireland. Um, originally, it doesn't have much of religious significance. Um, it, 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 it's mostly ethnic and political. Um, but when the Church of England breaks away from the Church of Rome, now folded into this conflict, which already pre-exists before you've got this sectarian dynamic set up, now is a sectarian dynamic. And of course, whenever you throw religion on, a, on, on, on the fire of conflict, it acts as an accelerant. You know, I mean, people do this all the time. You know, if you're not, if, if you're not trying to quench the flames because you have an understanding of the, of the core teachings of, of peace and, and human dignity, but you're trying to stir people up by making them afraid that their religion is, is under siege and God is under siege somehow and you've got to protect not only yourself, but you've got to protect God, as blasphemous as that idea, you know, uh, seems to me to be. Um, but anyway, the, the, so, so it's, it really is important to understand this conflict, whoops, to understand this conflict even though, you know, we roughly call one group Protestants and the other group Catholics, um, that it has deep roots in the contextual history of this part of the world, uh, roots that have to do with power struggles, with, with occupation, domination, um, injustice, these kinds of things, things that have not been injustices that have not fully been worked out. And again, this is my point. Here is a picture of the, the bombed uh, uh, mosque in Samarra, uh, supposedly bombed by Sunni insurgents. It's a Shiite mosque. But one never knows in the Iraqi context because there are a lot of folks who have no particular uh, confessional commitment whatsoever but do have an interest in inflaming sectarian conflict. So anybody can be responsible for these bombings. But presumably, uh, Sunnis are bombing the Shiite mosque. Presumably, okay? Um, so like those Catholics uh, throwing Molotov cocktails at the, at the, you know, at the, at the, at the, at the, the, the Protestant police, um, but like our second image, this is a majlis of, of, of Sunni and Shiite clerics in Iraq. Uh, there's a society where they come together, and in this particular, this was in, the, in Life magazine, this was a particular session where they produced a document calling for the end to sectarian violence. These are the, the leaders. Uh, the shuyukh, the sheikhs of, of uh, you know, the, 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 the Sunnis and the, and the Shiites, you know, uh, throughout Iraq. Not all of them, of course, the extremists aren't going to be there. <laughs> um, but uh, many of the folks who are respected. They also led a joint prayer um, in Baghdad in 2004 that, that spilled out of the mosque, which Sunnis and Shiites were praying actually together um, in, the same, in the same ritual process. Um, again, something that could have made the news, even as a soundbite, but but it's interesting why it, I guess it made the news or else I wouldn't know about it, but of course it wasn't headline news, right? Um, um, uh, here's my little, you know, the, the kind of counterpoint for the little map of Ireland. <laughs> it's the map of Iraq. We have a kind of similar analogous dynamic going on here. You know, the boundaries of the nation state of Iraq, as many of you know, were not drawn by Iraqis. Yeah, anyone know who drew the boundaries of the nation state of Iraq? Yeah, coincidentally, and this is not meant to be a slam against the British. It's kind of, you know, the British history is British history. I mean, they've been everywhere, and, and uh, they, they were particularly proficient at developing the art of colonialism, um, as well as the French and, and, and many other European powers. Um, and uh, yeah, after World War II, uh, sorry, after World War I, uh, the Ottomans uh, w sided with the Germans, uh, uh, turned out to be a mistake. Sorry for all my Turkish friends uh, here. And uh, uh, so what the French and the British did, who were the victors, the allies, they divided up 
the Ottoman lands. Um, uh, the Turks were able to protect the Turkish heartland uh, from being occupied, and then, then that leads to the genesis of the modern Republic of Turkey. That's another story. Um, but when the British drew these boundaries, um, you know, they weren't paying much attention, or maybe they were, uh, in some odd kind of way, to the fact that there, was, there were three distinct ethno-religious groups. There were Kurdish Sunnis in the north, the second largest group, uh, Arab Shiites in the south, the largest group, and then Sunni uh, Arabs in the center, the smallest group, as well as some other groups, um, you know, in, in addition, but these are the three largest groups. And then in the Ottoman Empire, you know, you didn't have a nation state. These three communities were, we, we have a term now, semi-autonomous that we use, right? They were kind of semi-autonomous. They paid taxes to Istanbul, you know, but they pretty much ran their own affairs. And because they, they, they weren't forced to be members of one polity, they didn't have to decide how to share power in that way. You know? So there was a little more social equilibrium. I'm not trying to paint you know, a rosy picture. You know, social life and political life is always difficult for human beings. But, but, but now, with the drawing of these boundaries, you know, one day, ta-da, you're all Iraqis. And you've got a flag now. Congratulations. You have a flag. It means you're civilized, finally. Right? And, and, but now, you, you have to have a government. Who's going to rule? Well, the British set up the, the monarchy among the smallest uh, sort of of the three groups. Why? That's good colonial practice because after you leave, you know, uh, that, that, that monarchy is going to continue to be dependent on you to maintain its power because it doesn't have a sufficient demographic power base, at least until it can gain adequate control of the economy of the new country, you know, kind of in collusion with the former colonial powers, so that now it has a stronghold on the economy and then maybe the military, and then maybe it doesn't need to rely anymore on the, the former colonial powers. And, and the Ba'athist party of Saddam Hussein, which overthrew the monarchy, comes from that same group as well. And the, the, the two larger groups that were marginalized were the Kurdish Sunnis in the north and the, and the, and the Arab Shiites in the south. So you had this, this conflict among Arabs between Sunnis and Shiites. Um, you know, always some tension there, the sectarian tensions that were rooted in a number of different contextual you know, issues throughout history. But now, perhaps the, the, the most serious and most powerful issue, we all have to belong to this one polity, and we, the Shiites, even though we're the majority of the Arabs in this country, we don't have any power. We don't have any economic power, we don't have any political power, we don't have any mil military power, and when we try to assert ourselves, we get the iron fist, and great persecution, and massacres, and things like this. So then when the Americans come in <laughs> with the invasion and, and, and you know, are talking about democracy, right, at the point of a gun, which is a little strange, but you know, uh, there's going to be a democracy here, the Shiites are finally saying, great, happy day. You know, we're going to have some say. And what do the Sunni Arabs say? They say what every human being would do in that context. I'm so happy now that things are going to be fairer. I couldn't wait. I was just waiting for the right opportunity to give up all the power and wealth that I had and share it with other people. Especially people that I've been persecuting before to keep that power and wealth. I've just been eager to do this because I've, you know, I've, I've been up nights you know, worrying about this. It's been really tearing at my conscience. No. This is nothing, I say human, right? This has nothing to do with being Iraqi or Arab or Kurdish or Muslim or Christian or any. This has to do with being, with being human. So this conflict on a very real level is a, is a political conflict rooted in history. It's got a religious sectarian dimension. I don't mean to downplay it, but you know, in the mass media soundbite, all we know about this conflict is it's between two groups, and all we know about the groups is their sectarian religious identity, and we draw all kinds of conclusions about that uh, that lead us down all these, all these blind alleys that don't help us understand the conflict and therefore don't help us, you know, you know uh, if I say us as a, as a sort of democratic, quasi-democratic society here in the United States, you know, use our voices in the political process uh, to help formulate better foreign policy. Okay, number four. Um, but where the spin doctors? Obsessed with dying utopian fantasies. Ayatollah Khamenei, clinging to a dream that the fulfillment of the hopes of Tahrir Square can lie only in an anti-secular Islamist regime. And Senator Mark Kirk, Republican of Illinois, obsessed with the outdated policy that the US and Israel can tolerate only a thoroughly secular regime in Egypt. I'm talking, of course, about 
you know, what's, what's going on in the Arab Spring. And I don't know if some of you, I tried to refresh my memory about, it was a, it, the, I think it was the Atlantic recently, you know, had one of these, the Atlantic always comes out with these disturbing covers. Um, and um, it was a cover of a, of a woman in, 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 in full veil with niqab and just her eyes are showing, you know, all in black, one of these, these two stereotypical, you know, mysterious, dangerous Islam kind of images. And it was all about, you know, is the Arab Spring going to be just an excuse for the rise of Islamic fundamentalism, right? Okay. So um, you got spin doctors on both sides who are saying the same thing. And kind of as extremists, I would say, political extremists, excuse me, extremists in their own right are feeding in to this stereotype which can actually be very dangerous because in some ways some of these things can be self-fulfilling prophecies. But Ayatollah Khamenei on, um, I think it was February, his, his Friday khutbah on February 8th, um, uh, no, no, February 4th, I guess, no, February 8th, said um, that the uprising in Tahrir Square was an, was an Islamic uprising. And he was talking about how this is the beginning of a revolution in Egypt that was going to be like the revolution in Iran and the establishment of an Islamic Republic of Egypt that was like the Islamic Republic of Iran. That's hard to imagine for all kinds of, uh, you know, kind of historical uh, and contextual reasons. Uh, but be that as it may, for me, this is this dying utopian fantasy that, that the only remedy for the ills of Muslim societies is a political regime that is as anti-secular and anti-Western as you can possibly get. In other words, the idea that that's the way to be the most Muslim. It's sort of this, you know, in, in a way, you, 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 it, it's, it's almost a westernized, secularized idea that we can be most Muslim by defining ourselves against the West. You know, actually, you're, you're, you're forfeiting your identity in that process more than you are holding on to it. But this is a dying utopian fantasy of someone like Ayatollah Khamenei. It's understandable given his age and his background and his context, but, but it's out there. Then you have Mark Kirk who writes a letter to President Obama saying, oh, watch out, the Muslim brethren, the Al-Ikhwan al-Muslimun is going to take over Egypt and they're a radical Islamist organization. They support terrorism and Hamas and all this. You know, Mark Kirk doesn't know anything about the, 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 the Muslim brothers and doesn't know what a complex you know, social and political organization that is. They're certainly going to play a role in the future of Egyptian politics. They already are uh, playing an important role. Um, you know, but to hold on to this fantasy that the only solution for Muslim societies to address their problems as Mark Kirk sees them is to have thoroughly secular governments like the government of Hosni Mubarak, that's another dying utopian fantasy. And you've got two sides that are going to continue to cling to these fantasies. And I think the, the, these fantasies are going to play off one another, uh, I think, as we move toward the next presidential election, especially when foreign policy issues come up. We're going to, I think, see some rhetoric about this, you know, starting to be, starting to increase. Um, and, um, you know, uh, I'm worried about it. I'm worried about uh, whether, you know, these important developments that are going on in the Arab world right now and very delicate dynamics that are, that are unfolding, you know, are going to be, are going to be, you know, skewed in, in, in very negative ways uh, by spin doctors on, on both sides. Let's see how we're doing. Okay. Um, yeah, this is more about Tahrir Square, kind of to complete that, this, this, this slide. I just wanted to, these images are powerful for me, right? The, 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 these are uh, pr protesters in Tahrir Square, in this peaceful protest, in Tahrir, loudly peaceful protest in Tahrir Square, uh, uh, doing this halat. Uh, it might be Friday prayer. Uh, it probably is. I'm not sure, though. Um, um, and um, so you, fee, you see a deeply religious dimension. Um, f at least in the individual identities of the, of, of, of the people that are gathered there, all right? Their Islam is important to them. You know, they may all, they may interpret it in very different ways. We have very different people here, you know, in this group. We don't know who they are, what their particularities are. Um, but, but this is an expression of the importance of the tradition, right? Um, but look at the slogan. If you look at the slogans, this is a sha'ab yuridu isqat al-nizam. Right, this is a very, this is not a religious slogan. Right? This says, the people want the fall of the regime. You know, and the slogan was being written on Egyptian flags. And people were draping themselves in Egyptian flags. Egypt as a, as a secular nation state, basically. 
You know, they weren't burning Egyptian flags and saying, you know, this secular nation state is bad. We want to, you know, have an Islamic republic, you know, with a new flag. And, and you know, let's only shout Allahu Akbar or something like this. I'm sure people were shouting Allahu Akbar because that means, uh, thank God, God is great. You know, this is a wonderful thing. And people were indeed shouting that. But it's interesting that the, the slogan which, which, you know, you had in Tunisia and then you had in Egypt and is kind of became a slogan of the Arab Spring for a while, you know, is not in any way overtly religious and, and it l left room for a lot of people to become involved in this whose primary, you know, whose identity is not necessarily primary rooted in, in religion and religious practice. So again, the complexity of the identities, um, you know, involved in, 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 in these new movements. Um, you know, it's, it's also interesting to know that this little pamphlet, um, uh, uh, Kisatul Montgomery, um, the story of Montgomery, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., translated into Arabic. You know, um, you know the people were saying throughout the protest, "Selmiya, Selmiya," I mean, peaceful, peaceful, keep it peaceful, right? On one level, that's rooted in you know traditional Muslim Egyptian cultural values. You know, we're people of peace. We don't want violence. We don't want conflict. We don't want bloodshed. Um, but but also people were reading you know the works of nonviolent resistance. You know what what you know how nonviolent resistance can actually be effective. You know, and and you can actually accomplish more uh, through nonviolence sometimes than through than through violent means. Um, and then this image, which I love, especially as someone who uh, does Christian Muslim relations, um, you know, in his own in his own vocation, uh, holding up the cross and the Quran, you know. Uh, kind of Christians and Muslims in solidarity. And there were other expressions of this. Sheikh Yusuf al-Qaradawi, uh, when he returned to Egypt for the first time in many years, great Sunni Muslim sheikh, respected uh, throughout the Arab world, uh, when he gave his khutbah, instead of saying, O Muslims, which is a traditional way in which the, the Friday sermon begins, he said, O Muslims and Copts. You know, so he was, he was recognizing the, the primary important interreligious makeup of this freedom movement, that it's yeah, like about 90% Muslim, but 10% but Christian, uh, Coptic, Christian, Egyptian Christians. And, and it is a profoundly symbolic uh, move to begin a khutbah you know, by, by addressing it not just to the Muslims present, but also to the, to the Egyptian Christians who were present. Um, hmm. All right, let's, um, okay, we'll do this one and then this will be the last one, okay. Um, uh, I want to just strike a, um, a kind of um, contrast um, between what I'm calling classical jihad theory and practice and what has come to be called jihadism, okay, and just, you know, suggest that these are two different, two very different phenomena, and we really need to understand the difference, right? You, probably many of you have heard that the term jihad comes from a word that means, uh, a root that means to struggle. Um, Quranically, in its broadest sense, jihad is the struggle to live righteously. So every human being that tries to uh, serve God and serve one another has to be a mujahid because it's not easy to do that. You have to struggle every day. Um, there's a famous um, hadith attributed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He's coming back from a, uh, from a, from a raid, a military engagement, and he says, we're returning rajatna min, min al-jihad al-asghar il al-jihad al-akbar. We're coming back from the lesser uh, jihad fighting against uh, our enemies um, to protect our values and our way of life. Um, and now we have to go to the greater jihad, which is, which is living up to these values that we're, <laughs> that we're, we're striving to protect, right? You know? So um, uh, this, the, the, this idea. Now, in, in, in classical Muslim jurisprudence, the word jihad has a very particular meaning. Um, and it, it does have to do with when, it, when jihad is treated in juridical texts, it, it, it has to do with the whole question of when it is licit and when it is not licit to take up arms against the enemy of the enemies of the community. Um, and so it becomes the, it, it's really the, an, the rough analog of just war theory in, in Christian theology, for instance, you know. And there are 
parallel sets of criteria, like what are the, the criteria you have to have to legitimately be able to take up arms against your enemy, and then once you're taking up these arms and you're engaging your enemy, how do you have to conduct the war justly. So all kinds of prohibitions against, you know, injuring non-combatants and prohibitions against uh, injuring the environment, like scorching the earth and, you know, burning down trees and polluting water and things like this. The classical jihad theory is says kind of out of the question, which is why many traditional uh, ulama, actually, and, and Iranian clerics too, um, have declared that nuclear weapons are haram. Uh, because they they could never be used in a legitimate jihad because they violate uh, these principles of destruction of the environment um, and also non-combatants the, the you know the the the, the death of non-combatants um, so that's jihad theory in practice and in some ways it's kind of iconically represented by figures like like Salah al-Din al-Ayubi uh, the great military leader who united a bunch of fractured dynasties to respond to the threat of Western the Western Crusaderism, right? Uh, and eventually did so successfully. Um, you know, kind of, uh, he actually had to sort of revive jihad theory, you know, because it had been a long time since, you know, the, the Christians, you know, there outside the Darul Islam, you know, had mustered enough power to actually make that kind of incursion, you know, into lands that have been controlled by Muslims for, for centuries at that point. Um, what about Osama bin Laden and this phenomenon of, 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 of jihadism? You know, what, well, you know, does this go back as some people would have us think, well, this is, this is just, you know, someone who's just drawing on classical jihad theory in his own struggle against injustice. Well, he, I'm sure he saw it that way. You know, I, you know, I, I have no doubt he saw it that way. But w when you go to really trained jurists, which Osama bin Laden was not, people who actually can issue fatwas, w which Osama bin Laden actually never had the qualifications to do so, uh, you know, he, he violated all kinds of principles, like non-combatants. He's a non-state actor, for instance, and one of the principles of being able to actually legitimately call for a jihad is you have to be uh, a recognized leader, uh, social and political leader of your community. Yeah, what we call you know, a state actor, someone who's accountable. Um, and so it's not the case for Osama bin Laden. So, so you know, while he may see you know, his, his military endeavors as he would see them, his terrorist endeavors as others would see them, as, as jihad, they really were not uh, seen, uh, they would not be seen as such by most mainstream uh, Muslim jurists. Um, it's really a phenomenon that has much more to do, much less to do with classical uh, fiqh, classical Muslim jurisprudence, than it does with the Cold War. And uh, this is something that maybe many of you in, in the room know, but, um, you know, just sort of by way of, 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 of wrapping up, um, that, that, that really, you know, um, when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan in the 1980s, there were, uh, there was an indigenous fighting force that, you know, was fighting against the Soviet occupation. Now, to be sure, you know, many of these people would see themselves as mujahidun, that, but that term wasn't really, if you look, go back to the media and look, to the, look in the sort of public discourse about this, the term was never used uh, in, in the earliest days of the struggle. Um, uh, the CIA, some of you may have seen uh, Charlie Wilson's war, right, with Tom Hanks. The CIA eventually got wind of the fact that, well, we could maybe, if we help this indigenous fighting force, we could get another, you know, conventional Cold War proxy war started in Afghanistan where we have Afghans that we can fund and we can arm who will help get the Soviets out of Afghanistan as part of our global geopolitical struggle, you know, against the Soviet Union. Um, so money started to pour in, and one of the things that money did was uh, go to the madrasa system, which madrasas are just religious schools, that's all they are, teaching people basic literacy in Quran and Hadith. But now what we'll do is we'll get all these young boys and we'll, we'll, we'll teach them Quran and Hadith, but we'll really focus on verses and things that have to do with fighting infidels. And then we'll teach math in the following way. I had a graduate student who wrote an article um, uh, on this, uh, published article on this, uh, textbooks that were produced in Nebraska by your tax dollars, folks, uh, that teach third grade math this way. Six infidel tanks are bearing down on your village. You have three rocket-propelled grenades uh, by which to launch at the infidels and by the mercy and, and will of God, if God wills, destroy them. You do, and by God's grace, you destroy these uh, three infidel tanks. How many infidel tanks are left uh, for you to destroy being the instrument of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Well, if you're teaching math that way, <laughs> um, you can imagine what's happening in religious education. 
and you can imagine what's happening with issues of spirituality and, and what, the, what the Sharia really is, what, what, what Islamic law really requires, and really is the totality. Basically, um, you're turning Islam into an ideology, um, and you're doing it because you're getting money from the CIA, and the CIA is helping you, and now you're going to be called Mujahideen, jihad fighters, you know. So, you know, this has less to do with people trying to establish a direct connection with Salah din and classical jihad theory and much more to do with, you know, we don't want the Soviets here. Uh, the Americans are going to help us get them out. Um, but not realizing, you know, uh, at what cost yeah, to your own society, at what cost to your own tradition. So we got through five points, um, and I'm a little over time even doing that, and I apologize for that. I probably did linger and do too many make too many tangential comments, but this is certainly enough for us to sort of have some discussion, and I think, I hope, maybe we did, you know, get beyond in some ways um, some of these media sound bites, even though I know that many of you in the audience have far more to teach me uh, about these things that I could ever kind of uh, enlighten you about. So thank you for your patience. Thank you.